Engineers working on the cleanup at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant have hit another snag. They say radioactive water may have seeped out of a storage pond. A spokesperson for Tokyo Electric Power Company said engineers detected strontium on the wall of the pond outside a waterproof sheet. He said the level of radioactivity is low. He said engineers will investigate what caused the problem, and he said they plan to transfer the water to another pond. Engineers dug the ponds to store groundwater that floods into the reactor buildings and gets contaminated. They have to filter and store hundreds of tons every day. They've reported a string of other problems. The cooling system for a fuel pool failed on Friday. It was offline for three hours. And a power failure last month caused a blackout that lasted 29 hours. Workers at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant have managed to repair a cooling system that shut down. It's needed to cool hundreds of spent fuel rods. Spokespersons for Tokyo Electric Park Company say workers heard alarms earlier in the day, alerting them to the trouble. They say crews were installing a metal net around an electrical switchboard. The net may have hit the board and caused it to stop working. The spokesperson say more than 500 units of spent fuel rods are stored in the pool for reactor number three. They say workers managed to repair the system after about three hours. They say conditions remain safe throughout. The temperature in the pool stayed at about 15 degrees Celsius. And they say the level of radiation around the plant did not change. A blackout at the plant last month stopped some of the cooling systems for more than a day. TEPCO officials said a rat caused a short circuit. So they instructed workers to put nets around switchboards. The operators of Japan's oldest nuclear reactors will soon have to satisfy a tougher set of rules if they're to keep their aging plants running. Following the meltdown at Fukushima Daiichi, Diet members passed a law last June saying reactors must be decommissioned after 40 years. But the law also said the plants could keep going for an additional 20 years if the operators got permission. Three of Japan's 50 nuclear reactors are at least 40 years old. Two are at Kansai Electric Power's Mihama plant and one is at Japan Atomic Power Company's Tsuruga plant. The three are all offline. But the older plants now face stricter inspections. Officials with the Nuclear Regulation Authority say operators who want to run their facilities beyond 40 years must conduct ultrasonic checks of their reactor's entire structures. They also have to closely analyze the strength of the concrete in their reactor containment vessels. A new set of requirements will also be introduced for all reactors by July. Operators who can't meet them may be forced to decommission their plants. People who work in Japan's fishing industry are still hurting two years after the earthquake and tsunami in the northeast. The raging waters left cars, cement blocks and all kinds of rubble strewn across the ocean floor. Local authorities haven't been able to do much to improve the situation. So some fishermen are turning elsewhere for help. NHK World's Marie France Sato has more. Yasuaki Kagi takes pictures under the sea near disaster areas. He captures images of the rubble from the Great East Japan earthquake. The water is still cold in February, 
that this doesn't hold Kagi back. Cars, homes, they all got washed into the sea by the tsunami. But amid the devastation, Kagi finds life. In February, a collection of Kagi's photos was published as a book. Ever since, he's traveled to events around Japan. He shows his photographs and talks about the condition of the seafloor. With all that wreckage, the ocean looked scary at first, but in the end, the photos gave me hope. That was good. I want to show new life emerging in the sea near the disaster area. I believe these photos will give hope to people who may have been discouraged before. At the end of February, Kagi traveled to Iwate Prefecture. Some fishermen in Taro World had invited him to take pictures. The fisheries here are among Japan's top producers of abalone, sea urchin, and other luxury seafood. But after the disaster, like the port's breakwaters, a lot of debris was carried out to sea. The fisheries harvest plummeted to 30% of previous levels. City officials had all the concrete rubble dumped into one area. They wanted to find out if sea urchin and the baloney would attach themselves to the debris. But the project was put on hold to expedite land recovery. The fishermen hope their business will recover soon, but underwater research hasn't progressed. So they thought Kagi could give them a sense of what's going on under the surface. Last year we were only able to try harvesting sea urchins twice. At one point we hardly caught any. Kagi will check if the sea urchin and the baloney are living around the debris. About eight meters down, he sees some wreckage. As he approaches a large chunk, he discovers that a few sea urchins are living on it. But he only found one abalone. However, seaweed, which abalone eat, is growing amid the rubble. Afterward, he shows his pictures. If the rebuilding gets underway, I think it will be a good fishery again. Some are worried that the seaweed will not grow among all the different kinds of rubble. Two years after the disaster, Kagi's photos are raising the hopes of Japanese. They also provide important information about the state of the fisheries. Thousands of tons of floating junk has begun washing up on the U.S. West Coast. It comes from Japan, carried into the Pacific two years ago by the tsunami. Some Americans worry not only about the rubble, but also its unwelcome passengers. NHK World's Tomoya Yoshinaga has more. Newport City, the U.S. state of Oregon. A new monument sits near the shoreline. Until the tsunami in 2011, it was part of a floating pier at the port in Misawa, Aomori Prefecture. Last June, it was found on the Oregon coast. Authorities had the pier dismantled, but they kept a segment to remind people of the disaster. They'll be able to understand the story and they'll get to see it and touch it and learn a little bit about how to uh, about tsunamis and earthquakes and learn how to be safe. It's just one of many autumn ends beginning to wash up on the US West Coast. Japan's environmental ministry says more than 220,000 tons of it could reach North America between April and September and it might carry unwanted guests. Researchers say that of the 150 species in the debris, about 30% are not native to the U.S. To address this concern, U.S. researchers visited Japan. They teamed up with a Japanese university and did an on-site survey of marine creatures. Their goal was to confirm that the non-native life in the debris came from Japan. They also wanted to identify 
which species the creatures belong to. John Chapman said the creatures might affect U.S. plants and animals. Before the tsunami, we thought that the animal, the organisms on this, these floats could not drift across the ocean. It was like seeing a spaceship. They began at the Misawa port. Divers collected marine life 50 centimeters square. Some of these creatures are not found in the U.S. Okay, that's all over the bottom. We didn't find those. We didn't find those in Oregon. They collected samples from 23 locations. Then they classified the samples and they confirmed one of the non-native creatures belongs to the Assyrian family. Our estimate of 150 species is the minimum number that made it across. That's what we're going to estimate here with this kind of research. We're going to tell you how that happened. More foreign marine life is expected to arrive along with the debris. U.S. experts plan DNA tests and they're also preparing for the impact on the ecosystem. Authorities in Seoul, Tokyo and Washington are responding to reports that North Korea has loaded a medium-range missile on a mobile launcher near the East Coast. NHK has learned from Japanese and U.S. diplomatic sources that North Korea transported two large pieces of equipment to a site near Wonsan. They say fuel tanks and mobile launchers were also unloaded from a train in the same area. Images taken by a U.S. satellite show what analysts believe could be a ballistic missile transported eastward by train. South Korean authorities suspect it is a Musudan medium-range ballistic missile. The Musudan has an estimated range of 2,500 to 4,000 kilometers. It's capable of hitting targets as far as Japan and the U.S. island of Guam.